Thank you very much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as we planned, 15 minutes past the hour. Please seat it. As I already already did the introduction, so I wouldn't repeat it. So now let's go to the conversation and also the presentations. We are going to welcome onto the stage Rebecca Maynard, professor from the University of Pennsylvania from the US. Christoph Metzger, who is a professor from St. Gallen University from Switzerland. Varney Cheravanot Ross, founder of Concordian International School from Thailand. Christopher Pomeranin, founder of Learn Life from Spain, and Jin Jin, uh, Tian, Tian Jin, who is a young leader here, but also I've been doing research uh, about the educational change. We want to welcome all of them onto the stage. I guess that's the only seat left. I will go over there. So I think we want to grasp really the topic today. As the topic being presented here is called the change of education. So let's just see what does it change, what does it take to change? Why, as quoted earlier, the ancient, whether Western or Eastern Oriental philosophers all love change, but so difficult for us these days to change and reluctance to change. What are the factors behind them? How can we overcome them? What does it take to change? What direction to change? And do we have plans to change? And do we have specific case studies for change? Ladies and gentlemen, you have a lot of responsibilities today to answer all of these questions and better with specific real answers rather than rhetorics. So that's why we have all of you uh, the real insiders mm -hmm. onto the stage. So let's go with the structure. We have Rebecca to open the conversation to present to us what could be some of the challenges for change right now, in what direction. And then we're going to have Tian Tian uh, to present to us some of the research results she's been doing over the past few years in that direction. After that, we have three wonderful case studies on the stage. Uh, and they are going to present to us each with seven minutes of uh, the specific things mm. they've been doing over the years in order to make change happen. Mm. So now, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Five minutes, no more than that. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, no no uh, big challenge here if I get five minutes to solve the world's problems. Yes. Uh, so I. You know, I, I, I want to not focus so much on the, the, the challenges and obstacles because I'm a, I'm a glass half full kind of person. And I think we um, have started something in this meeting here today, uh, yesterday and today. Um, you know, we have some real bright spots from which, which were highlighted in the PISA results. We tend to focus sometimes on the, on the problems, uh, but I think we need to, we need to um, learn from uh, those places that are doing well for, learn about um, the, what it, what's different between the students who are succeeding in countries that may not be doing so well overall um, and from the students who are, who are failing. Um, and I think we've, we've just heard a lot um, from our uh, practitioners and from our, our policy makers uh, about ways that we have been invoking change. So, um, I guess what we want to do in this session, I think, is to step back, take a deep breath, and consider what's really required to change education locally um, and globally in the ways that, that the young uh, leaders here have been pushing us to, in ways um, that are positioning us for the future. So I want to th focus first on the, the scope of the challenge. Um, and here I want to say that there are great schools around the world. Every country has some great schools and we have some places where almost all the students are succeeding. We have places where some su students are succeeding when most are not. We need to learn from those experiences. What's different? It's, it's not just serendipity uh, that some get through and some do not. So, so we've, got, um, you know, we've got a lot to build on here. The economies are changing uh, quite dramatically and uh, at different paces in different places. Um, the skills demands are changing, uh, but we've got the diversity across across the, the globe, and we can learn from this. Um, 
So with, with few notable uh, exceptions, the employers, I think, have traditionally not been a part of the conversation about education. I think that's what's really different about this meeting over every other meeting that I've been in in the past 40 years. Uh, we have done most of the, the planning of education among the educators and the policymakers and not involving the employers specifically. So we have a lot of exemplars to learn from, and you're going to learn about some of those in, in our case studies that will be presented. Um, and as we share what we know, um, what I want you to do, it, to, to do is to encourage you to think about um, education institutions, businesses, communities, and systems uh, that we have and how we can learn from them. We just had two great examples of, of um, uh, institutions that are working to change, in one case, the teacher profession um, and, and the way we're training our teachers. In the other case, the mathematics uh, curriculum, instruction, uh, professional development, we, we have not seized the opportunities to learn as we go in those, uh, some of these reforms that we've been putting into place. What we need to do is be uh, in, in bed in a lot of what these changes that we're doing, um, sort of some stealth evaluation so that we understand as we go what, what is working, what is not working, where we can build in um, improvements, and importantly, we need to share this information. Most of us w could not today go out and find the information we need to uh, understand the British experience with the Shanghai map, for example. The, the, the information is not out there in an easily accessible format. Moreover, I think uh, there were some missed opportunities to learn along the way what, you know, the, the, the team learned lessons, but they didn't bottle those lessons in ways that we can easily access them. So many of you are going to be learning those same experiences in your locales, and it would be nice if we could have uh, a better system for sharing this. We are now in the United States. Um, embarking full spore on systems of having what we call evidence agendas within the institutions, whether it's business institutions or nonprofit institutions, educational institutions. Build your evidence agenda. Where are your pain points? How are you going to tackle them? Embed um, research, research meaning you want real evidence. You want to know if it's working, um, if it's not working, if it's working but not as well as it should, and you want to gather the information that says, well, what kinds of adjustments might make us uh, uh, overcome this hurdle and get on a better path. So um, with all that, I'm going to just sort of get off the stage and let my um, colleagues here give you some their personal experiences um, in, the re in real transitions. Mm. I think I heard two key words from your earlier talk. One is, rather than change challenges, it's opportunities. Secondly, let's talk about the pain points, okay, and how to solve the pain points. Yeah. Now, Let's go to Tian Tian. Tian Tian sitting on the right side. She's been doing research over the years about employability, meaning how would one be able to acquire the capability so that he or she will be welcomed mm -hmm. in the workplace. Now, Tian Tian, I hope no rhetoric, real numbers, real stories, real case studies, please. Okay, thank you. So um, before I jump into my five-minute duty, just a brief introduction about myself. I'm Tian Tian Jing, graduated from Columbia University with my PhD in Cognitive Science and Education. And now I'm working at Pearson doing all tons of research about education. And also I'm proudly uh, a young leader of FWE. Um, so like, I'm going to a real honor to sit here to, with all these experts talk about the employability. But people um, sit over there probably ask, while well, this person is young, what she knows about employability. Well, first of all, um, I'm not as young as most people think I am. I'm, even though I'm really happy about that, it's a gift. Um, secondly, um, at the life stage, who, when people is so eager to be well employed, the most, so I have the solid motivation to figure out what is motivation, uh, what is employability. Thirdly, I and my team and other colleagues at Pearson are doing a series of research about employability. So that's why I do know what employability is. So we have identified like four areas make up employability based on formal and informal research with employers, educators, and learners. Um, the first area we call it core academic competency. So this is just um, a solid foundation of literacies, um, numeracies, and 
digital forensi. So this is also what our PISA study uh, is always testing and evaluating. Without this, um, I would say without this uh, skills, regarding um, which field you select, what type of um, education you pursue, there are basically very few opportunities going to open to you. So this is the foundation of everything. The second area is occupational capacity. So this is our skills very specific to specific jobs. For example, um, nursing skills for people who want to be a nurse. So, and this is also what vocational education you really focus on. Um, and also one thing I do want to emphasize here is like in this area, how to learn, like instructor needs to teach students how to learn. Since like this is going to be really um, drive the lifelong learning. I think like um, my colleague is going to have a really good case study in later. And the third area, um, we call it personal and social capability. Um, I think this is definitely equally important as the previous two areas. Um, this is also um, named as soft skills, 21st century skills that most people are familiar with. So these skills are general and transferable skills, um, like uh, when people really want to know how to work both individually and with others. So um, we have reviewed um, many existing frameworks and related um, research about employability and um, labor market intelligence. We have uh, identified six common skill sets, include um, critical thinking and, um, and creativity, collaboration, communication, self-management, social responsibility, and leadership. So actually, um, I guess most of you guys must have known that the, all of those skills have been talked and raised for years. But the sad thing is, many of us still assume that students can uh, develop those skills naturally. But then, I mean, like you put students in the same room, have them to work together, and you just assume like they will develop collaboration skills. But this is not the case. Sometimes people just learn the wrong strategy and they have very bad experience, and this is not helpful at all. So this is, this would be a bad example of like uh, learning by doing. Um, to really help students attain those skills, what we need to do is to have uh, explicit instructions. We need to design authentic learning and assessment and also provide good feedbacks in the whole teaching um, experience. And the last but not the least area, we call it career knowledge and transition skills. So these are the skills learner needs to transfer um, what they do in school, in higher education, and the experience at work to their futures. For example, how to showcase your credentials, how to showcase your accomplishments in the best way, how to brand yourself, and um, how to develop a presence in the social media. And you know, the social media is super important in current area. Um, so I would say like, to summarize all these four areas, I would say they definitely play different roles in a person's career path. If you just want to be possibly employed, then you definitely need the academic foundation, which is a core part. But if you want to get a position, a specific position that you want, please to learn more about um, those occasional capabilities. But, and also if you want to get promotion, or want to be a manager, well, the PSC skills, the personal and the social capability, definitely what is necessary. And also, if you want to jump to another position, which I'm not promoting right now, but if you need, and also if you want to have a startup, probably the career knowledge and transition skills will be necessary. And if you want to have a very successful career, I would say master all of this force. Since uh, none of us sitting here is right now trying to seek a new job, well, maybe I don't know. Um, maybe, I guess. So uh, when it comes to the connection between education and your research, what would you suggest? Because that's the topic today, right? Yeah. Change of education rather than how would you seek a new job with the new skills you just acquired. So one 
minute, can you maybe summarize? Yeah, I would say this is definitely connect to education since like uh, we throw all the observations and this is actually the fact because like there is a lack, there's a hole in the education system that we don't have specific explicit introduction in our education system to teach people about those, all those employability. I believe like in our like yesterday's panel, Jesse mentioned that uh, like why, why all those like training, like uh, soft skill trainings, is responsibility to the employers, which is not the correct thing. I think that reason is like in our current formal education system, we don't provide such training. Mm -hmm. And I think this is definitely should to be changed. Okay. Now, we have the challenger setting the stage. We have a research follow-up about what are some of the so-called employability skills and capabilities that need to be advocated in our educational system. Now, here is the thing. How can we do it? The other three speakers on the stage are going to provide us this very critical information by doing. That's very important. Now, we want to have from the formal educational channel, uh, Professor Christoph Metzger from St. Gallen University, Switzerland now is well known for educational, uh, vocational education. And Professor is exactly going to provide to us as to how it has been doing, what are some of the current issues need to be worked out given the technological development, given the global landscape, and many other new issues. Professor, you have seven minutes. So, coming from Switzerland, as you know, east of France, a small country with about roughly 9 million people living there, in a country with four national languages. I will not talk about a case in the sense of a strong change, because I'm telling you about a story which has a long, long tradition. Centuries ago, it was established. The so-called vocational education and training in our country. As you know, there is something like a world skills competition. And Switzerland was not doing uh, badly. They won last time uh, a few. Well more than 10 gold medals. So a colleague of mine told me, put a subtitle in the sense of the gold standard of informal vocational education for young people means the story of telling about VET in Switzerland. I put a question mark behind it. You will learn about why I'm trying to answer this question in the sense of I will show you a little bit of the system, the effects, and draw some conclusions. First, vocational education and training is the most popular form of upper secondary education in Switzerland. Upper secondary already. That means at the age of about 16, young people will decide whether they go to vocational education or follow up general education. About 70% of all students will go, still go to vocational education, mainly to aiming to aim a federal diploma. Some of them will aim at the federal vocational baccalaureate and a small portion of them will aim at the federal certificate. Only about 30% will go through general education, mainly to the so-called gymnasium or uh, college-bounded kind of high school. 
and some of them will go to a specialized school. Going or reaching the baccalaureate at the gymnasium means you, are, you get the right to enter all kinds of university studies, with a few exceptions only. There are some attributes of this VET. First of all, there is a multiple duality in this system. First, it's not only about vocational competences in a, in a narrow sense, but it's on the one hand, we teach, or the students, the apprentices, learn professional domain-specific competences, they are all so socialized to the working world, and on the other hand, they get a need to reach to general, interprofessional, societal, and academic competences. In order to get this, we need two learning locations. One is the workplace, where Usually, the apprentices stay three to four days a week. And on the other hand, we have vocational schools where the apprentices go one or two days too. The vocational school, by the way, has two goals to reach. It's about domain-specific theoretical foundation related to the professional domain specific area and on the other hand general education in the sense of communication or language and so on. The second attribute is the system should be as permeable as possible. There is a kind of horizontal permeability permeability, in Swinglish, that's not an easy word to pronounce. And on the other hand, a vertical road. Vertical means mainly that close or ending up with a vocational diploma does not mean to be a dead end. Because the continuing professional education on tertiary level becomes more and more important and so you have a variety depending on what you reached at the VET level in the sense of going up to a University of Applied Sciences or to professional education institutions like in the area of hospitality for example. A third attribute, a precondition is that we have a strong collaboration between four partners. It's on the one hand the professional organizations, means branch organizations, social partners, trade unions, companies. On the other hand the vocational schools, but then the state, uh, the federal state, and the cantons come into this collaboration as well. And the a long experience is you cannot transfer this vocational system just in the sense of export it, find some companies, and they do apprenticeship. No, you need this collaboration. Well, what are the effects, or which is the impact? And based on empirical studies, we can conclude it is quite an effective and efficient system. Apprentices, the majority of them, have or get a, a high satisfa satisfaction. They get good career prospects, and they even get paid during the apprenticeship. The companies 
get future employees with competencies which are needed now and in the future as far as you can predict what will be the future. And companies get even a net benefit by doing or in being involved in this apprenticeship system. And finally, the labor market. Looking at the labor market, you will find in international comparisons that we have quite a low youth unemployment by this system. We have a strong integration into the labor market after ending up with vocational education and training. And the state saves money. It is much cheaper to have this system compared to full-time vocational education schools. I come to conclusions. I was not, well, my will wasn't I should sell this system. Nevertheless, it seems to be historically grown quite a promising system if there are some conditions fulfilled. We need first a very strong belief in the educational and economic value of vocational education. We need a strong cooperation and shared responsibility. Uh, we need a highly flexible and continuously reshaping system. We need the opinion in the society that the mainstream of education of the education system is vocational education and it is directly linked with work experiences but there is one backside of the medal if it's silver or gold doesn't matter how far it is really accepted socially. Even in Switzerland, I put on uh, one number. The social status is, far, uh, is questioned by about 40% of the population based on empirical studies. In other words, means we need to work precisely in this area of how far it becomes more and more dangerous that vocational education gets stigmatized. We are not yet in this state, but it could happen the more parent, the parents try to push their children, the project of one child, for example, into the college-bounded school. So finally, I wouldn't answer the question, it's the gold, the gold standard, but nevertheless quite a, com a promising kind of educational system. Mm -hmm. For us, it's not a change, but maybe for us. Mm, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor, if you can, within 30 seconds, tell us a little bit more about, there's one question about change, because Switzerland, despite of your wonderful tradition, is also changing very fast. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, you have blockchain villa, uh, villa villages mm -hmm. and things like that, focusing on innovation as the key national policy. Now, Professor, the curriculum mm -hmm. that has been used in this vocational training, has it changed? Meanwhile, how is it answering you know, demands coming from companies that are already in this very big evolution of change? 30 seconds, if you can. No. <laughs> uh, two aspects. One is young students learn to adapt to innovations 
in the easiest, the easiest way by doing an apprenticeship in a company. Companies are forced to get, become strong in being adaptive to innovations. Second, with, or with this collaboration between federal, state, cantons, and the companies, the professional organizations, they need to reshape the curricula quite fast. And we learned during the last 20 years that we need to be faster even in reshaping curricula. Mm. Thank you. So you are saying let the messy stuff happening as they go, right? Is that what you're trying to suggest? Okay. All right, then. Thank you. Let's go to the next uh, uh, speaker with another great case study. We have uh, Ross Varney Sharavanot coming from Thailand. Now, uh, Varney, before we come up to the stage, I think you have one very big responsibility. If you, before, because if you look at the stage, we have one only from developing country. I'm not trying to give you a title, but it's very important because we have big global supply chain as we speak. And we also see that um, Thailand, for example, with the current educational level uh, from, from the legacy of the history, uh, how you are trying to bring the most update and the most efficient way to education, particularly for companies' future. That, I think, is what you are thinking about and also you are trying to do. So let's also welcome your case study coming from Thailand. Just a brief introduction myself. I'm a ex-banker and a founder, but now a founder of an international school in Thailand with a trilingual immersion program in the IB curriculums. So we teach English, Chinese, and um, Thai all together. So what I'm doing here today as part of the uh, steering committee is also, but actually representing my father yesterday, Mr. Danin Jeravanon, to talk about what our corporation do about the training program and why do we need to do it. This is the um, training center that we call the CP Leadership Center. And it has many rooms and things like that, almost like a small university of its own. But what it does is, let me see. Okay, these are their four projects. Okay, you see the little seat? That one, we call them token, um, or we should like a small boss, little boss. I mean, these are newly graduate. Um, sorry, these are newly graduate um, student from university, and um, we select them, and then they join the program for six months. The second one is uh, either they graduate and move into the second stage, which is a young entrepreneur. They come from a selective uh, young possible uh, potential leader from every department in our company. So every department must send somebody who with a potential that could become a leader um, to join this program. And the middle range, the one that sprouts a little bit, well, that is from the middle management. So they also come to the program to learn something new. And the last one is an executive level. And in all of these cases, in general, they will come up with a new business. That means maybe, um, let me give a brief introduction to the company. So we are a multinational uh, agriculture-based uh, company that went into telecommunications and many other things in real estate. We employ uh, about 300,000 people all around the world. And um, with the expansion that we happened, we felt the need that to develop new leader all the times. So this program actually started from the executive level um, many years ago. And now is uh, we go back to the seat where we bring in a whole new young people. So what we do is that they come in and they would, uh, let me see if I can get this one, um, spend some time and start working on the 
These are, they come from about 10 countries that we are vast expanding, but uh, we have offices in 21 countries all over. So these are the young leaders that come and join. I'm just going to talk about the one that just newly graduated. My father believed that um, young people have ability to sprout, especially if they fresh out from university and they never work anywhere. They don't have a set culture. So we can set that culture. But the culture in CP is that we allow them to do anything. So uh, after the first few weeks of orientation, they group together from different kind of expertise in a group of six to eight. And uh, we tour them, the whole company, let them understand what we need and what we have to support them. And then they go to business with problems. And their job is to do whatever they have to do to improve it. Through that, sometimes they even come up with a new business. And then we would fund a new business for them to start a, a new department. But the thing about the whole thing is that the kid, the student, they come back and report to us every two to three weeks what they have done right and what they have done wrong. And we also concentrate on what they have done wrong or what difficulty they face. So that, and what did they do to solve it? Or sometimes they don't know how to solve it, they would ask all the executives. If you remember um, the first picture where a lot of people were sitting, they report in front of nearly like uh, three to 400 people. And in the middle line is all top executives, starting from sitting from chairman to every executive on all business level. So they can ask for help right there. And also they can report things that everybody can share and learn from what they're facing on the front line. Whereas because a lot of executives are sitting in their office, they don't really know how difficult it is to, to open a 7-Eleven or something like that. You know, or what difficulty is in this location, or if we raise some crop and it doesn't work, why? Why is all this happening in certain unit? So they have the autonomy to make decisions on the spot. But they must report to their uh, direct supervisor first. Is what they're going to do? And what my father said earlier, the supervisor could only suggest, but they cannot guide. Because when you guide, then the students start to think, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this and that. But they could suggest some idea if they think it's possible. But the student they have the right to make decision. In this way, every decision they make is become their responsible. And the mistake or the process that they they win, the, they succeed is become part of the full corporate learning, not only themselves, when they come and report. Um, they, they, we work with um, many units around the world, so kids from all different countries come and, and, and work on this project. And then we send them back. Some of them will be sent back to the, their unit, and some of them actually start a new business that the, the, the company actually sponsor them. He, he have a saying say that a, a calf are not afraid of tiger. Because a little cow, when they're born innocent, they don't know what is difficult. They don't know there's a tiger that can attack you, but he said that the new kid that just came out, you see there's so much energy in them that they want to do a lot of things, learn a lot of things, and it would not stop them from doing it because they don't, realize, they don't have all the politic matter that they have to concern about. In this sense, I mean, the tigers may not have a political situation in a company or in any kind of organization. But they have the power to, to, to be themselves and to do the best they can be. And, and we don't punish them for making mistakes. We teach them and we learn from them and together. Because he think that the business was changing so quickly that, that you know, somebody like him wouldn't know what's going on in a real or any executive. And he think that if we're going to launch something new, why do we use somebody that was successful in other business where he, maybe he's stuck with the same idea and again and again? So if the business is new, why take the old talent? Why do you take a whole new person? Because they're eagerly not experienced in a new business. So that all these young talent bring a whole new perspective to the company. And all the old talent is a guidance or coach and let them aware of things that they need to learn in terms of the corporate or in terms of a risk that they have to take and things like that. But they have the autonomy to do that. Because we find that once people go into the company, they become part of the old system. What he tried to do is let's break through 
they like removing the silo. And he did that with the old, uh, um, a little bit the management area. They may bring manager from different, uh, they could be accounting, uh, engineer, I don't know, um, agriculture. They also join together and they need to launch a new business as well. And it's take them out of their comfort zone to also like learn something new in a new industry. And, and that also create many new business for us as well, or expansion or replacement of whatever we may have made mistake in the past. And then there's another, um, actually we start, this is, uh, let me see, okay, 7-Eleven, we uh, have started an institute called Panya Piwat. Um, Kun Gosak, which is one of the really top executive, I think, now he's an advice. Um, he's, he's, I really admire him because when he started this project, it was for, he recognized that people who work, we, we own like 12,000, 11,000, 7-Eleven store in Thailand, which is really big. He realized that the, the people who come and start working in 7-Eleven, they may be 7 or 18 years old. Uh, may not even finish a vocational school, they may just have like a 10th grade education. If they have to stand selling things until they're 25, they physically cannot stand for that seven years, you know, 12 hours a day or eight hours a day. So he wanted to find a way so that they can graduate into something different. Mm -hmm. So he start almost like a university, like that they work and they um, go to school at the same time. By the time they reach 25, they'll have a university degree. Meanwhile, he also sponsored a kid that want to work and study at the same time at the, when they leave uh, 10th grade. And three more years, it's almost like a vocational school that they can also move on into university. And in this way, we are not only um, providing job for them, and when they're working, we pay them as well. The benefit is would be obvious that we have constant supply of worker that are good quality at the same time our worker have future they are not there to be slave forever sitting standing in a counter until they're like 60 years old and retire we plan the future for them and um, and that's part of the company philosophy we are turning a hundred years old uh, in I think 2021 and one of the main philosophy that we have is that First, it doesn't matter where we do business. The benefit of the country comes first. Then is benefit the people of that country. And only then it will benefit us. He said the same thing for leader. Leader must realize that leader of corporation or any organization must realize the benefit of the organization comes first, and then the benefit of the people who work for them comes second, and they themselves is the, to receive the last benefit. Only then they receive the last benefit. And that go with everything. That, that means the concept is that to think for others before think for yourself. Um, now as an educator, I would like to ask so many famous university here and educator. Imagine if 1% of university around the world that are getting all the top students from every country, in their own country and any other country, implant the same value into their student. That they want to come out, it doesn't matter in what business field they do, is to really truly benefit society. They don't launch a product that they knew is poison to society. They don't come out with rule that is this benefit to their staff. Before they get the bonus, are their labor already have a good health insurance or they, do their children is carrying, take care of? Especially in a developing country, do we really looking after those cheap labor? They are another human being and, and, and those decisions are made at very top. Those decisions are made at, at the, the people with highly educated. But imagine just that one percent of the kids that attend university around the world, each of every university 
have them that compassion for other human being, for animal, for the world, we wouldn't have what problem we have today. But parents and teacher or university mainly tell them that you're going to become a great leader and make great thing. You make a lot of money, and that's what important. Yeah, money is important. I never tell my student you should become social worker. I think they should be a great entrepreneur. They should become top executive. But when you're sitting in that place, every moment you make decision, you think for other people. And and that's um, I believe that we lasted this long because we believe that truly that that everything we do, we um, in terms of agriculture, we share knowledge with third world country. Mm. Very few people share agriculture knowledge and food knowledge to every third world country we go to. We actually create our own competitor. And my, I asked my father why. He said, because com competition is good. It makes us work harder, make customer have choice. Things will improve because we are, we are competing. The benefit go back to the people. Okay. So that's, I think, um, conclude uh, most of the things that I would like to share. And actually, there's more information, but I don't think I can do it in seven minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Barney. Really appreciate it. I think we can feel the real compassion you have for education in this sense, and also the ethics that's important in the educational system. But if I could just follow up with one very quick question for you as well, Varni. That is, um, we heard from Jack uh, yesterday that he's thinking about it's not going to be 6,000 conglomerates in the world anymore. It's more about 600, uh, it's more about 6 million uh, small and medium-sized companies around the world that's going to make the change. Um, of course, whether you subscribe to that or not, that's another issue. The thing is, uh, entrepreneurship has become such a trend, particularly among the young people. So when you are trying also to educate them and provide them with advice, uh, how would you compete you know, with the fact that many of them want to be on their own? Uh, many of them want to you know, fly away even uh, one or two years in your program. I, I asked him the same question. So, um, so are you saying I'm asking like, the right question or yes, the wrong question? Yes, you're asking a good <laughs> question, yes. Because I said that you know, many of them would quit or they wouldn't want and if they learn all this skill and they want to do their own business. He said, I'm looking for diamond. Any, anybody else who are not suitable, maybe they're diamond somewhere else or they will be important in some other way. Then we create, a, how could I say, then we send our entrepreneur with the right value to society. So he, like I said, he doesn't mind that we have competition. Yeah. He congratulates them if they can go out and make their own business as long as they have the similar core value with us in whatever business they do. That, mm. you know, it's, I think he felt that way that actually he's doing something, giving back to society. Mm. So it's part of the growth of the company and it's also part of corporate social responsibilities, I guess, of the company to do this specific project. Let me go to the next one, founder of uh, Learn Life from Spain, uh, Christopher Pomeranin. And what kind of say, case study are you going to present to us now? You will see in a second. Okay. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, are you ready to positively change education? All right, can you just stand up, everybody, for one moment, please? Because I think we were sitting down a lot today. Exactly. You all have mobile phones? Can you put out your mobile phones? If you have something like a flashlight, put it on, please. Point it at me, all right? Because I will, exactly, thank you. Point it at me. I want to make a picture of all of us, because all of us are going to change education from today to the future. I make this picture, and you can all download this, okay? There are people also behind. Yes, that we'll are try the change. trying oh. to make this work. Okay, all the way. You better have your phone recharged. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. All right. We can sit down. We can sit down. Yes. Good. You not, because you have now seven seconds to answer. What is your purpose in life? Uh, my purpose in life could be to experience everything that I should. Perfect. That was even four seconds. All right. All right. Why am I asking this and why I'm having a microphone? Because, and, and I'm standing here because I think it's also time to change the way that we are actually preaching or teaching or instructing. Okay. And I think standing in front or behind these things does make us, you know, better people. 
So I'm rather, I would love to sit with you in a circle right now, but okay, that's not possible. Um, all right, so I'm asking you about purpose because yesterday we already spoke about that a couple of times. Actually, 76% of all our high school students have no purpose in life, okay? And um, I want to make this very clear because also yesterday we spoke many times about what AI and machine learning is going to do to us in the next 10 years. But, you know, if we don't put this in context, then we don't know what this means. And the context is that in 10 years' time, this rate if we still continue to standardize our education, we'll be at 100%. Because every child that will get out of a school that has standardized systems around the world will not understand what he or she is going to do next. All right, but I'm here to speak about solutions and stuff that we have been starting to do five years ago. Um, so five years ago, um, together with a group of amazing people, we have started to gather thought leaders around the world that have been trying to change education for the best part of the last 15 or 20 years. Um, but you know what? They have always bounced off education systems, trying to implement innovation, but have not have received the, let's say, the place or the time to do that. Okay? So basically, um, over the last five years, we've gathered more than 50 thought leaders around the world that physically, physically come together to change education and build a completely new paradigm of learning. What have we done? We've gone around the world to more than 100 of the most innovative schools that exist in this world, and we have researched and analyzed what are the best practices that exist already today in many fantastic settings around the world, and if we would visualize them, if we would aggregate all that data together, we actually would have an amazing set of a new learning paradigm already today. So that's what we did. And you know what we came up with? And it's already out there. What is the shift in paradigm? Have we heard a lot of personalization and mass personalization over the last two days? You know what? Mass personalization is just the first step. That's what ad tech companies around the world are trying to do for the last eight years. But that is one step of four where we have to go. Okay? So after personalized learning, because personalized learning is still something that we do to our children. Right? We personalize each one, but we still instruct. We don't empower them to be their self-determined learners. Okay? So after personalized learning, you go to co-created learning, and then you go to personal learning. Personal learning, maybe have you heard of hoitagogy? Okay, after pedagogy, we are in the world of hoitagogy. And that is what we are learning, or well, that's what we're working on. Pictures taken? No? Okay. One more for Brazil. Okay. All right, good. What else? Well, if you go around the world and you visit all these amazing schools, you will actually identify that we have been all in schools and we have been learning on one methodology, and that is the cognitive learning methodology. If you go around the world, you'll find that there are more than 25 methodologies that kids are able to learn today. So if we would be now having a backpack and we would be learning different methodologies that we could apply to kids, you could provide every child with their perfect set of learning methodologies that will help that child to learn self-motivated for life. Pictures taken? All right. Good. So to make this very short and clear, there are three very concrete strategic action steps, stuff that I would like to see at these kind of conferences more. So you create positive relationships. We heard about values today. Values is one set of culture. You need values, you need vision, right? And you need purpose in order to create culture. And positive relationships is the outcome. That's the one main point that's missing right now in any school around the world. Positive relationship is what we have to re-establish. Then you can actually understand purpose of each one. Purpose-inspired learning is the next level. And um, you see these little... Uh, little things behind, so culture, self-awareness, growth mindset. I did that for Andreas and for the PISA uh, crew. Um, so these are some of our, our I would say, um, talking points that we would love to establish to see, can we find actually, 
KPIs or data points in the future, you know, how to actually uh, go around the world and speak around, you know, different school settings, countries and systems, what this could be looking like, okay? And basically, if you then go to a hoitagogy or personal self-determined learning, you would come to be future ready. Okay, so we are on a small mission, uh, and you're all invited to this mission. And this mission is to empower 100 million learners in the next 10 years. Uh, we do this through 5 million educators, about 100,000 schools, and 2,000 learning hubs. This is a critical mass. This is about 6 to 7 percent of the world, because we think that if we reach that in the next 10 years, we reach a tipping point in every country around the world to understand what learning needs to be looking like into the future. And Learning Hubs is going to be the most significant strategy in doing so. So I will explain you a little bit about a Learning Hub. So the first Learning Hub exists in Barcelona. You're all invited from this moment to come to Barcelona and visit the first time a space that is created to establish learning in a completely new way. So it is basically all these thought leaders over the last five years have, have come together and we have created a space where everything is possible. Learning is possible in the way that no structure has ever allowed it to be. So it's completely taking learning into the center point. Um, so if you, if you look at this, if you come to Barcelona, you would actually see a place where children are and they, if you ask them what does this community, what does this learning hub mean for them, it would, they would say it's our second home. And that is actually what we are talking about. We are speaking about creating learning hubs, lifelong learning hubs. So we can speak about early childhood like the panel before. We can speak about primary, secondary, university, master, PhD, or whatever you want. The future are learning hubs where learning happens cross-generationally. And it doesn't matter which box you belong to or which age group you belong to. We're all there for learning and we want to have a home where we are recognized for this. Okay, so I'm just passing through very quickly. You see some images. And then I think one of the most amazing things right now is that actually in Spain we are uh, right now building the first learning hub within the system. So next year all age learning hub in the system will be launched for up to 400 uh, people. Um, and and that, will, that is recognized by Spain as being the lighthouse for 20,000 schools in Spain to have a very clear idea, every school, every public or private or whatever school can come to the school and see clear the next steps, what the school has to do in order to accelerate to fast innovative learning environment. I'm just quickly showing you what we're building in Hamburg. In Hamburg, we're building a 20,000 square meter lifelong learning hub. It is the first of its kind. It's built from scratch based on the new learning paradigm. Uh, it is meant to be for 2,000 uh, learners in the age of 0 to 108, or, how, you know, or maybe 109, I don't know. <laughs> Depends how, long we, how old we get. Um, and I think the beautiful part is that you really can go from every part in the building to any other part and you are a lifelong learner and that means you can be 75 years old and you go to a three-year-old and you do a reading story or something and at the same time the five-year-old will sh show the 75-year-old how to swipe the iPad. Um, just in light of time, I'm flipping through this. What does, what did happen now? In the last eight weeks we got contact by the German government because um, you know we are doing now several uh, we have several talks in for several regions in Germany um, so with the ministers of different regions and now the, the the overall country government came to us and said can you please send me uh, the the concept of building learning hubs and so what we that what we did is there are 8.3 million kids in Germany if you divide that by 10,000, you come to 830 hubs. So if you build 830 hubs around Germany, as a, you know, you know these uh, social economies, so where you put like one hub in between of many schools, this is the, the concept. So you can actually empower every kid to go to one learning hub uh, once a month, so 10 times a year more or less, and experience completely innovative learning uh, in a completely new culture and learning for yourself, personal learning. And then you get, and the teachers actually get trained on certain new um, 
new elements of learning, and they take that back towards their school, and they can implement these new ideas into their own school, right? And the interesting part, it's one billion um, investment, and the German government has already dedicated five billion just for digitalization, right? But digitalization is happening in these learning hubs anyway, so you have basically many different parts in one. Just to say, I mean, we're talking about Germany, we're talking about Spain, so our next learning hub will be in Kigali, uh, in Rwanda. Uh, so the idea is a one-to-one -one, um, ratio, so we're building one in a developed country and one in a two-developed country. Um, and right now we have uh, many people and many entrepreneurs and many governments around the world that are interested in implementing learning hubs as the lighthouses for innovative change of education around the world. Uh, so the idea is to build about 2,000 uh, between private, private, public partnerships or publicly funded, which is the ideal form of this. And um, just to final up, because I think this is about action. As you see, this is a very clear strategy. Uh, it's already started, so it's not something that we are imagining into the future. We have now, uh, f for next year, we have 35 cities and countries around the world that want to start learning hubs. I mean, physically, we're able to build, I think, three or four right now with our resources and team that we have. But we will be growing to probably be able to build about 20 to 25 per year in the next three years. Uh, what happened about four weeks ago, you remember we have 50 thought leaders Valerie Hannon, one of them right here, uh, and several others, Kiran Brasati and so on from India. Um, so we opened this learning innovator thought the community four weeks ago to the world so that anybody, anybody of you can participate in building the future of learning. And in this community, over the last four weeks, we doubled to more than 100 thought leaders. So probably by next year's time, we will be 500 to 1,000 thought leaders from around the world building together in co-creation, not competition, co-creation, collaboration to build the future of learning. And that is my offer to you. So please uh, come join the Alliance. Mm -hmm. It is an offer to the Forum for World Education. It's an offer to the OECD, the same way that Ashoka already joined. We're now talking to the UNESCO. It's basically an aggregation of everybody that together for the first time joins in and builds something new for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. As being provocative is part of my job, may I ask you, is this a real estate world projects is this a real As, estate? because I'm seeing it's mainly the buildings you're talking about not necessarily the quote-unquote software or the real changes of teaching okay. or interactions good, uh, good question among all. so I'm, a, I'm, I'm my, my background is I have been building up technology companies for the last 22 years so I've been founding 10 companies and invested in about 30 and we all believe that technology will be the future um, change makers mm -hmm. until we found out that the world and everybody understands real change when you walk into a building and you see learning happening in real life. And that was actually about two or three years ago when we changed the idea of again creating another technology platform, but that really then just happens for seven seconds on your screen, it's the moment when people walk in Barcelona and they come out after an hour, after two hours, after a day, uh -huh. and they have seen the future of learning in front of their eyes and they say, it's 30 years further than we ever thought it's possible. We would love to know what is the future of uh, education, as you just said, because a lot of words being used here. Another provocative thought, if I could, is, um, you know, I would, such, I would argue for the argument's sake, that you walk into a central park in which you have generations of various kinds. You have people from different social groups. They can also interact. Seven-year-old can also teach a 70-year-old old how to use uh, you know, the latest devices. Why is yours the platform or the best way to do it? Uh, just for a provocative uh, Argument's sake, please. It's, it's not. It's just um, a offer to the world to start to collaborate together uh, to build the future of learning. And if there are 10 or 50 or 100 other um, projects in the same direction, 
then we would be probably the most happiest people in the world. Mm. And that is the big change in mindset. And I think everybody here... Um, Everybody here, you know, we have seen the fantastic um, graph on competition versus collaboration yeah. no? yesterday. And it's, it's exactly that. We have to foster collaboration because these challenges, they don't stop at a country, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, now they are sitting in Madrid and speaking about climate. This doesn't, cha this doesn't stop at a, at a frontier. National border, yes. We have to collaborate to understand what is best happening around the world and come together and change it together. Since people are so interested in this, I have to ask this question. How would you assess? Well, you assess, so what we do is 360 feedbacks, okay? So, but, and again, that is happening already since 10, 15 years around the world in some amazing schools. I think New Zealand, uh, is no, the latest country which has stopped uh, you know, uh, formal assessment. So it's just happening all, I mean, the most advanced systems already are taking away assessment. By the way, assessment is the biggest frontier and the biggest um, holdback of innovation in education. And that's an interesting discussion to have later on. We'll have it later on. Um, but yeah, so it's 360 uh, feedback. And uh, for us, we are right now looking into completely new KPIs um, that are meaningful for the learners. So for us, the most important thing, what happened yesterday, are there any 15 years still here? In the, I know there are young leaders, uh, but 15 year old still in the audience? No, they have to go home. So, so, so for us, the most important thing, how we started is we asked more than 2,000 um, kids how the school of the future looks like. And in the center point, it's them. So we are asking them, what are the meaningful KPIs that you know, would measure them into the future? Okay, Barney? Yeah, can I, um, I like your question, is this a real estate project? Why not? It's in many developing countries where the government doesn't have the money. The business people can provide this. And then maybe they should get a uh, tax deductible or, you know, to support this project for their community. They may, so that it's reduced from their profit that they make around the area. But then everybody benefit. Why not? It's a business. I think it's good. Uh, by the way, my sister is doing research. She won't have a learning center. And I think maybe we have to get in touch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we have about... And, and we love Thailand. Yeah. We come there every year. So. We have like okay. about, uh, I think, 10 or 20... Um, 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 school around high school or, and some university around our area, this learning center will be extremely useful. Okay, let's also move on this, uh, what this wonderful discussion we have about so-called innovation, I innovative ideas to change education. Now, there will be many who have questions like mine, probably even more, to ask exactly what's the nature of your institution. But that brings us one important question, that is, what is the change that we are talking about here? Is the change uh, in the way people interact? Or is the change in the way to open people's eyes about education? What is even more important? But you know, these questions are only shallow ones, I would assume, mm -hmm. compared to the questions coming from our audience. I know we are running out of time, but we have many of them who are coming from very different economies. I think it's important to also let them ask a few questions and let our uh, panelists to respond. And eventually we go to Rebecca for a, a summary for that, okay? Uh, could I have some hands, yes, raised, okay. There, one lady over there. Uh, there's some, would, would, is anyone from this corner want to ask a question? Okay, over there, please. Um, good afternoon, my name is Janet English, and I'm a, I work at a public high school in Southern California. I'm also the president of a nonprofit called the Teacher Research Initiative. And I want to commend Christopher on the work you're doing with collaborating across cultures. And the reason I said is because I spent six months in Finland learning how they optimize learning. And I brought that back to the US, and we incorporated that into um, optimizing learning for large, heterogeneous, diverse classes. And it's made a profound effect on children's learning. And we could not have done that without understanding what our cultural biases are and how our system is set up to inadvertently affect student learning through teacher practice and student practice. So we're, we've been learning how building these systems together is imperative for us moving forward and how we learn different things within our own systems that can contribute to the optimization of learning for all. So thank you so much. 
Is there a question? No, the it's question all is, about the plots. The, I, well, the question would be is, um, as we're moving forward and we have such, such um, passion for moving forward, I hear a lot of vision. But I would like to hear steps from different countries about how they would like to step forward and say, let's work together because we have great teachers, we have great things going on, but we're not collaborating as a globe to, to really benefit all. So that's really my question for the panel, as well as anyone in the audience who would like to step forward and, and work alongside. In other words, like what us. does it take to collaborate? Is that well, the what, question? Who, well, the question is who wants to and what would you like to contribute or get from that collaboration? Because mm. assessment comes later. The design has to come first. Okay, to, right. So. wonderful. How to do that design. Any other question? I saw Ali over there. Yes, please. Okay. Good afternoon, guys. My name is Nishida. I'm working in Dream a Dream organization from India. I have simple question. Uh, did you guys think education is more important in our life? If you answer no, why? Uh, Say the last part again, sorry. Did you guys think Im more important educa uh, in our life is education is more important in our life? If you yes or no, why? Education, whether it's important in our lives. If yes, why? If no, why? Right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's a very profound question. <laughs> I guess we have to answer that in quite a long length. But uh, anyway, this gentleman, please. Um, uh, Albert, I'm so glad uh, to see the diversity from which uh, the questions are being asked. That's very important. Please. Okay, so just want to react to the, some comments earlier by the panelists. Um, uh, Albert and the EY chairman uh, for China. So from a company standpoint, if I may, uh, fully agree uh, with many of the comments. And, and I think uh, I would suggest uh, the Swiss experience about this apprenticeship and the German experience, I would suggest probably uh, they have done so well that they should publicize a little bit more to, uh, around the world. Uh, because working together with, between the school, the educators, and the companies are very important. And if I may use the EY experience, uh, we always say learning never stop at EY in the sense that for many of the companies, we have to understand learning is not only at the schools, at universities. Even people after they graduate, they continue to learn. And anyone who thinks they can stop learning, I think would be dangerous. And for many companies, uh, you look at many of the multinational com established companies, they would try to recruit graduates as trainees and rotate them among the different departments to train them for the future. And the same thing when I look at ourselves. I mean, people sometimes complain that people, firms like us, I mean, uh, professional services firm, we have high turnover. I never look at ourselves, I never look at that as a problem. In fact, we like turnover. The thing is, we recruited a lot of graduates. I mean, every year, just in China, we recruited maybe 1,500 people, fresh graduates, different background, not only business background. I mean, they can learn English, they can learn social science, if I may. We train them, and then we, they, after a couple of years, they learn the skills because they work at different clients, and yeah. then they become very senior executive at different companies, and that is something that we have been very proud of. So from that perspective, I think from the educators, there's so many of them here, I would suggest we have to link about how can we train more people so that they can continue, the mindset is to continue to learn after mm. they graduate when they are working, and they can move among different fields in the future. Right, Thank of course. You. It, you're suggesting companies are thinking in different ways now yeah. as to whether they are the training ground yes. for the future exactly. talents for who might leave yeah. them for the other jobs. That's yes, right. indeed. Any others? Yes, please. So after this, one more if we have, and then we come back to the panelists to comment. Hi, my name is Maryam from the UAE. So from Christopher's presentation, I saw one of the slides that was talking about learning methodologies. And I noticed you mentioned sustainability-based learning methodologies, game-based. But why aren't we talking about fact-based methodology? When we look at global challenges or when we talk about global challenges, there's, I think, a lot of misconception and ignorance. And we think that the world is doomed and that we're not doing better, but we actually are. 
Mm. Poverty is being halved. Women in uh, leadership roles or heads of state and government is increasing. So when we talk about these global challenges, such as climate change, we look at it as a battle, but it's not. It's an opportunity. So why isn't the education system shifting that mindset? Why aren't we shifting the narrative from doom to hope? We should look at these challenges as opportunities to innovate, to find solutions, or as a call to action. And I think this is where we come in at a young age, teaching these children that global challenges are spaces where you can co-create and find solutions. Mm. Okay, doom to hope, whether that could be reflected in all of the latest uh, innovation in education. Okay, uh, one final question if we have. If not, if not, we're going to come back to the discussion. Very briefly, I think we have maybe only 10 minutes uh, left. So let's have some of you to quickly pick on something. So go to you first. Why not hope-based? Why not hope-oriented? So fantastic. Um, so if, for, for example, if fact-based learning, is that a new methodology? Maybe we just have fault number 26? That's exactly, so I hope you, you, you already are a member of the Alliance and you propose that as a, as a new methodology. Um, so we can actually bring it into the hub. The learning community can validate it and test it. And then afterwards it gets pushed to the world. So what I forgot earlier is that our research teams are building out of everything that comes together from around the world, uh -huh. um, learning um, innovation elements. They get tested in, in our hubs, and once they are validated by the entire community, they get published open source so that everybody, anybody in the world can access that. Okay? And that is my, also my, maybe my answer to the lady from the US. Um, so that's our proposal, know how to come together. And if the elements sometimes are more on a global level and not perfectly cultural fit to a certain setting, then it's the local learning innovators and thought leaders that would create the adaptation for the certain region. Okay? So thank you for that. And then maybe just to your uh, question, uh, learning and you know, if that's also you said education and if that's important. So me personally, I would say education is not important anymore. Um, and that's because the word for me, um, I think we have to really rethink the word. And I know we are in the future of education and, and even the, the <laughs> and the, and the organization is called education and the education departments are called education. But I think it's about learning and education is, the pro is a process that we have developed. Mm. But I think it's about, about really personal learning and personal learning is a process that is, has a thousands of facets. And I think, yes, that is the number one thing, lifelong learning that sits at the center okay. of, of us. Okay. Any other comments? For example, businesses and becoming training ground for the next stage of professional development? Yes. <clears throat> I'm impressed both by both the questions and the projects I learned about. Nevertheless, I won't give a lecture, but I have Three things to say. When I went to primary school during the last century, as you see, I already experienced both standardized learning and personal learning. That's not new, not a critique, but it's not so new on the one hand, and on the other hand, I don't like this black and white colors. And I miss one thing, that there is also an aptitude or competence to become an adaptive learner, because not always you can just make a choice about the environment you prefer most. And to the core competencies, and I'm selling <laughs> once more vocational education. Apprenticeship, in a general view, is quite a good location or institution to learn about these so-called core competencies. But besides all these core competencies, we should not forget that we need also knowledge we all would not be able to discuss 
these questions yesterday and today, if we not had some conceptions in our minds and we could connect several pieces of knowledge. So it's not uh, black or white, we need both. Mm. I think you're saying, let's not try to make all the changes in packaging, but rather let's make the changes in content. That's what you're saying. Content for the right kind. Of course, it's up to debate as to what is the right kind. Okay, Barney? Um, I just want to add on that. Um, I forgot to tell another part of the university that we start, PIM, is actually a merge between vocational school and university. That means while they're learning the four years, every other term they have to go back and work. They have to go to work. And we work with many companies that, that they tell us, okay, what kind of skill they need and things like that. And then they work with them and then we would place our student to actually uh, work in those companies. The company have a chance to even see whether they like this, uh, this, uh, this student for the future or, they, uh, or the student really like the industry that they're in. You know, if you have an engineer who sit in the classroom or maybe build a few gadgets in four years, can you really use them in a robotic factory? You know, like you invent robotics? Mm. No, if this engineer spend every other term after learning, go to work really in the factory that make robotics. The thing about vocational school that, that is it's a great thing, but a lot of people in Asia, so in my country, they feel that, oh, because if you go to vocational school because you have no talent, you're not smart, and they put them as a second-class citizen, which is not fair, and they feel that they're not smart, so their life is not moving forward. Mm. But if you can give credit to these people as a vocational school is as important as university, add thing to them, add more thing to them, then they will take pride, and you have workers that actually really, need, really know what they're doing in the field, not mm. just, you know, Top graduate electrical engineering, they draw some line. Have they really understand how the worker really have to go and do it? Mm. Or connect it, or life threatening that if you know, they misconnect, they would, could get killed? They probably can't even put it together. But imagine if they get to work in those companies, why would they design those, those, those electrical uh, uh, drawing? It, it would, and it, you know, I ask them, why, why don't you come and check the work? You have consultant. Consultant to be the job who check whether they've done it right. I say you don't take pride in what you design, so you just sit on the panel, I mean on the table and draw those. You have to be there at the site and really check whether it's work. Guess what? Maybe he doesn't know how to check how it's work. So you have to depend on consultant who have experience. So I, I think that if we can move the important of vocational school into university and, and merge this, we will have so much potential. Yeah. It's all about how would you ignite the twinkle in the eyes of the other. And that takes some time, social movement. And why not packaging? Packaging sometimes could also change people's mindset. It's good as well. So Professor, I'm not trying to argue with you about that. But, you know, it's interesting, a debate that we have on the stage. Let, let's go to Tian Tian before we have Rebecca to wrap it up. Is it okay? Like, ten, yeah, ten, I know please. we have limited time. Just quick two comments. First, I think your Christopher's job, is, I mean, the work is brilliant. I really want to visit your center. Um, a second um, comments to that Indian lady. So, like, she, uh, she asked like, whether education is more important. And my answer is a question, like, compare with what? Like, um, education is more important. I would say, like, compare with money. I would say, without money, we cannot have a good education. I mean, I won't say like really good, I mean like to improve it, to make a change, we definitely need financial support. And that's also why we are bringing like business leaders and education practitioners together in this forum. And second, like if we compare with happy, well, we will say like education is more important than happy, but if we, without any happy, without any interest, there would be no good learning outcomes. So I would say like instead of asking like, which one is more important? I would say like education should be embedded naturally in our life, like in like lifelong learning, mm -hmm. in our economics, like then like we won't have this such question. We were talking about the aspirations. Tian Tian brought us all back into realities. <laughs> but anyway, can, uh, can before I just we have go. One, and yeah, one yeah, answer please. on education. Uh, one I, final I know so many people who receive like successful in their life and they may only have fourth grade education around the world. 
you know, like a lot of my student uh, parents uh, may, came from China, they was never educated and they're a big businessman. I don't think is the word education is that important that bring you to success, it's the wanting to learn. If, if education is about want, making the person want to learn, once they can read and write and do basic math, they can learn on their own. But how could you inspire them to learn? and move forward. I think that's very important. Mani, you are bringing us back also to a profound question. What is the purpose of education? It takes another five days to work it out, but probably even more. Uh, any final words? No, let's quickly. <laughs> I need to. Oh, okay. <laughs> final, final words. I learned from my father, having been a Latin teacher, vocation has its roots in the word vocare, I feel, well, somebody is telling me, do this, and education maybe could be replaced to a certain degree by vocation in the sense of, well, if there is a German word, I haven't got the English word anyway. Lovely. I would love to learn all these languages. Wow, you have a very tough job, Rebecca, to uh, sum up all of these uh, issues. Well, I was told you only have five minutes or even less. Five minutes. I, I may not need five minutes. I guess what I want to, what I, I think what it appears that we have some real differences of direction up here, and I think that's not right. Um, I think we're probably a little bit talking past one another. I think um, what I'm hearing from Christoph is, uh, is that, that there, we're putting labels on things that I think are getting us in a little, a little trouble. So we have little people who need to develop into big responsible adults who can function responsibly and productively in, in the workplace. And, um, and I think to get there, we need some of this learning can come through exploration and can come through experiences in these learning hubs and, and we can learn a lot from watching how people behave in those learning hubs and, and move forward. Um, we have different models of teaching, but we do need, whether we call them teachers or, cl uh, or teachers in classrooms, we, there is, there's some um, learning from others that has to go on and, and learning where there's some leader, some conveyor of the, some basic knowledge, um, as well as some group learning, peer learning, experiential learning. We can, we can call it lots of different things or lots of ways of building these skills. I think when we get down to the practical side of this, we have, um, we have institutions in place. We have politics. We have social institutions. We have families. We have children. And we have, to, we have to think about how around the world we can move the current system to better serve us in the short run and in the long run put us on a path so that maybe uh, 50 years from now, maybe, maybe 30 years from now, the world looks very different in terms of how we move these children from birth to adulthood and into the workforce in productive ways. And I think we would be wise to sort of be forgiving of the language we use, the terms we use, the labels we put on, how we get there, and be very creative, um, very open-minded about what the best strategies are. I heard you know, two different ways here of doing vocational education preparation, giving folks the pipeline to hire better careers, um, uh, lifelong learning uh, is, is, is foundational here. How do, we, how do we sort of marry that with our traditional um, education system? Where can we, where can we, where can we um, blend here? So I think we've got a lot more in common. I also want to note that we saw two of the highest performing countries having very different structures and, and approaches to, you know, the top down versus the bottom up for education. Okay, so that says there's more than one way to get to the end game and I think uh, we, uh, that means that all of us need to 
be thinking about this from the perspective of, I, I sort of wrote down these things. First, we need to map our journey. Where, do we, each, where does each country, each community within the country, where, do we, where are we now? Where do we need to go to? What are our gaps? What are our holes? What are our end, end games? So what, get, we, need, we need the map of this. We need to have a means. We need to plan the means. And I think there we should be looking at one another so the experiences of one another, we need to find ways to, to build on the experiences of one another. That means we need to have evidence that we can, and we need to have evidence that's reliable, not promoting our means as the best for everybody else, but what about our strategies work, under what conditions, let's share that. And then we need to actually sort of um, assess how these means that we choose in our map uh, we have to put this in place and we have to monitor it. We have to monitor it and we have to make honest judgments about are we going in the right direction, the wrong direction, what, how can we make these adjustments. And I think when I look at something like the, the, the learning hubs here, I think of this as actually get that, that's the kind of research and, and innovation that we should have in the background that is going to help us accelerate along the, the, the process here. It's not going to be, I don't see in the near term sort of in these, these learning hubs being the place where all of our children are going to get educated. They are a supplement, they're a complement, they are actually preparing us for, I think, the future. So I think that this, I think we don't, at least my view of this is we've got lots of great material here in the job of those of us who, uh, as we leave this forum, is going to be to how do we take what we learn from the young leaders, take what we learn from the, the um, experiences of those out in practice today, um, the, the today's conversation, mm -hmm. and how do we create an, an agenda moving forward that will give us uh, opportunities for better, faster, more efficient, more effective ways to improve the, if you will, the learning, the knowledge, the productivity, the well-being of the next generation. I see. So it seems that you're trying to advocate sincerity, honesty, and you believe it's going to be an evolution rather than a revolution. But of course, that's also up to debate. And okay. we, want it, we, want it as, we want it as fast as possible. I'm not suggesting we drag our feet. Okay, so all right then. Problem. Well, I guess as they say when they were running for president, uh, that we are the change we are looking for. So with that spirit, not about politics, but the, really about lifelong learning, shall we wrap up this uh, one short one hour session. We want to thank the great contribution from all our speakers. They're passionate and they are trying to look for a real answer from the bottom of their heart. Thank you so much. Any house rules?